。所以啊，是我们今天很荣幸啊，我们那个新政院的政务委员唐凤游来我们现场。啊，我们 very we're very happy to have our digital minister of Taiwan, his counterpart, uh, Deb Kaf. At 18, and I don't even have to enter, even have to tell him what to say because he knows what to do. Thank you, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, so to somewhat compensate the lack of Q and A time in the previous session, we will start with the Q and A. Um, and <laughs> if you have any device uh, connected to the internet, please go to this website. Uh, it's called slido.com. S L I D O dot com. And once you're on this website, uh, you'll be asked to enter a number. Uh, so without the hash, it's just 728 or today's date. And once you enter the three digits, and you can press join or a small uh, like green button, and then you'll be dropped into this anonymous or pseudonymous uh, chat channel. And uh, here, uh, feel free to ask me anything, like literally anything. Uh, and if you uh, see other people's questions that you would also like to see me answer, you can just press like. Uh, and the uh, questions with the most number of likes uh, will float to the top on this projection here. Um, and for the rest of this hour, I guess, the next 15 minutes, um, I'll begin with a short introduction, maybe 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, uh, about my work in the Taiwan administration uh, in the public digital innovation space. Peters, as you're seeing here. Uh, but mean, meanwhile, as I'm talking, feel free to ask me any and all questions, which will show up in the phone here. And uh, once there's sufficient number of uh, questions, then I'll switch right back to, to Slido. Uh, my current favorite programming language is text slash plain. Uh, character set UTF-8. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's one of the most versatile programming language there is, and I'll explore that more in my talk. Um, I'm sure it's your favorite programming language too. Okay, <laughs> um, so so let's get started. Um, so. Um, I, Unlike many people working on democracy today, uh, I'm an optimist when it comes to democracy, and especially uh, internet democracy. This strange condition began when I was 15 years old. Uh, that was 1996. Uh, I discovered that the future of human knowledge, and indeed future of democracy, is happening on the web, and uh, my education in, in the school is all out of date. So I told my teachers that I found this wonderful constitutional democracy called Debian. No, really, I did. Uh, on the internet uh, where people use condorcet methods and those very advanced um, algorithms and um, you know policy development process and so on and uh, I want to quit school and begin my education on the wide web and surprisingly um, my teachers were very reasonable people and they all agree with it and so after that uh, I just dropped out of high school and started a few web startups and just participate in this wonderful um, community of the, like the internet society and the open source and free software communities um, to basically see that how people can come to consensus or at least consent uh, through radical transparency and rough consensus and so on. And so today I'm Taiwan's digital minister for a year and a half now. I'm applying the lessons that I learned when I was 15 years old, that is to say civic participation, rough consensus, radical transparency to the representative democratic system here. And surprisingly it's working and it's changing gradually our society. Now, um, so, right, so, um, so a year and a half, uh, two years ago actually, when President Tsai Ing-wen uh, first became inaugurated as our president, uh, she said an inspiring statement in her inauguration speech. She said, before when we think of democracy, we think about the opposition between two op opposing values. But now, from now on, Taiwan's democracy need to become a conversation between many diverse values. So the key point here in the, is the plural uh, of this uh, word value. So there's many values in Taiwan, and we're going to build a conversational, um, deliberative democracy out of those very different but diverse values. And indeed, previously, uh, when people think about the government or the state or things like that, uh, people tend to have this picture, like we have different 
departments, we had different ministries, we had different council within the parliament who talked to, for example, the environmental agency, may talk to the environmentalist groups, the Ministry of Economy may talk to, you know, developmental, you know, more capitalistic groups and so on. Uh, so there's different nodes within the government to talk to the different sides of stakeholders and people imagined that the government is what brings people together and what, who arbitrates between those um, conflicting or opposing forces. Now this model of governance, as all of you know, uh, has become bankrupt uh, within the previous decade or so with the advent of the social web and indeed the internet activism. And the reason is that people can organize now perfectly fine without a representative organizer from the mainstream media or from the representative democracy. And also because there's so many emerging issues, we can't have a different ministry or a different agency for each of them. And so if the government insists on being still this kind of rope in between, not only is its organizational value much lower than before, it will be torn between so many different interests that it become paralyzed. And so the distance between the government and the people while not increasing. Um, the distance between people and people have much shortened and it leads to a recession or a distrust uh, to the democratic institutions. So the way we're uh, working on this is basically reimagine the questions uh, governance systems uh, ask. Instead of asking you know, who we need to represent or uh, what is fair arbitration, we ask instead what is the due process in which that the various different stakeholders can find common values. And given the common values, can we come up with solutions that works for everyone, that everyone can live with. And so this is the um, idea of civic tech or basically technology that enable pe people to listen to one another. And this um, has um, basically a lot of international metrics measuring this, like the diversity um, of gender and uh, participation in the internet, like the uh, rank of like open data and accessibility, like the access to um, e-participation platforms and things like that. And since uh, 2015, Taiwan has been consistently ranked number one or number two in all of those metrics worldwide. And the reason is that at the end of 2014, there's a radical U-turn of national direction by Embrace the wisdom of the crowd and open government as the national direction. And it was kind of cat catalyzed and epit epitomized by an Occupy movement uh, back in 2014, uh, where people occupied the parliament for 22 days in a nonviolent demonstration. And uh, when we say demonstration, we mean it in like the demo day sense, right? It's a demo. Uh, because at the time, the members of the parliament in Taiwan refused to deliberate a cross trade service trade agreement uh, because they think constitution. Beijing is part of Taiwan or something like that. But in any case, they refused to deliberate a, um, a statement, uh, a treaty. And so uh, people occupied the parliament and did the MPs work for them uh, by basically uh, deliberating line by line what the service trade pact entails. And there's more than 20 different NGOs in all the different streets around the parliament in a nonviolent way, just deliberating aspects of this uh, cross-trade uh, service agreement. And um, I was part of the movement that supported the logistics and the ICT uh, communication um, for this movement. And it's called G0V.TW, or just Gov0. And the idea of Gov0 is very simple. For any Taiwan government services that all end in GOV.TW, um, we just registered this domain, G0V.TW, so that people, whenever they see a government service or website that's not to the people's liking, they can just fork that website and build a more interactive open version uh, that just trend, uh, changes the O to a zero on your URL and it's very easy to discover. It solves the discoverability problem. So like for the legislation, uh, legislative UNGOVTW, the corresponding shadow government is just ly.g0v.tw. It's very easy to remember. It's a very neat hack, right? So uh, the first, um, the first project of the Gov0 movement back in 2012, um, before I joined, uh, was called Budget G0V.TW, and it's essentially an interactive platform that shows a visualization of the national budget, and everybody can just look on the part, the specific project that they're interested in, have a real-time discussion on the discussion forum, uh, center on that budget item as the social object instead of on the budget as a whole. And uh, the idea, again, is forking the government, and usually the Gov0 projects are 
under a free software license or really the Creative Commons Zero license, which is not a license, it's just a declaration uh, to donation to the public domain. And the result is that when the state level government at the end of 2014 want to incorporate this into like the participatory budget program and things like that, they don't have to ask anyone. They just take the Gov Zero forked versions and merge it back uh, to the state level governments. And so far there's like seven different cities adopting this. And as of this year, the national government also merged this in so that today in join.gov.tw you can see all the 1,300 uh, national projects and all its um, KPIs, its deliverables and things like that and have a real-time discussion with the career public servants in charge of that governmental project, essentially bypassing the representative uh, democratic system and so it enables a real discussion. So wh why are there so many civic hackers in Taiwan uh, who during the Sunflower Movement, just a lot like me, I just you know talk to the, my um, clients that I need to take a three week leave because democracy needs me, right? There's hundreds of people who did that back in 2014. And why is that? Because I think um, I'm 37 now, uh, we're the first generation uh, in Taiwan that can actually do democracy uh, after three decades of martial law, which was lifted um, in 1989 around the time of personal computers, and we only had our first presidential election in 1996, which is about a year of the popularization of the World Wide Web. So internet and democracy, they're not two things. They're not two different branches of people. It's the same generation of people. It's the same thing in Taiwan. And so the advent of democracy and the advent of internet and direct democracy is the same time in Taiwan. We don't have like 200 or 300 years of a representative democracy tradition. When we had democracy, we had also the internet. So in Taiwan, when we see or when we talk about free software, we translate it as, as 自由, so it's always uh, free as in freedom to you know, assemble, freedom of speech, freedom to express, and never free of cost, because we know that freedom is never free of cost. Uh, our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation fought very hard to get those freedoms, and it's up to us to use the software freedoms to keep the society free. And so uh, at the end of 2014 and after the Occupy, there's um, many mayors, mayor candidates who were Occupy supporters or occupiers themselves who uh, very surprisingly found themselves elected mayors when they did not expect. Um, it, it's something that also happened in Spain also, <laughs> right? And, and in many other, um, you know, um, occupies uh, in, in that time. And so um, at the time, the premier during the Occupy uh, resigned, saying, I don't understand you people, and so he just resigned. And a, a new pre premier, uh, an engineer, said, okay, so from now on, crowdsourcing and open governance is just going to be the national direction. And so the occupiers and, and us, the supporters of the occupiers, the facilitators and the ICT experts were then hired into the national government in 20, early 2015 uh, to help designing systems to collaboratively solve issues um, such as Uber at the time. And Uber in 2015 uh, has entered Taiwan and operated legally uh, using rental cars and professional drivers for a while. But uh, in 2015, they also uh, introduced a new line of service called Uber X, and it is using unlicensed drivers and uh, unlicensed cars and without insurance. And um, the um, PR idea of Uber at the time is to use this meme, uh, which is a virus of the mind, right? This meme called sharing economy. Uh, this meme uh, means very different thing to very different people. But but for the Uber PR department uh, at the time, it means very specifically that code dispatch cars better than laws, so we obey code, not laws. So it's like very simple message that, that spreads um, around the world, it's not just in Taiwan. Um, and so it's a like epidemic uh, of the mind. So people, uh, after becoming a driver for a couple of weeks, maybe they feel that there's no protection, that they didn't actually earn that much, and they quit driving for UberX, but during that two weeks time, just like a common flu, they would have spread through apps to their passengers and to other drivers and to other passengers. And so it, it's impossible actually w at a time for us to negotiate with, with an app or with a virus of a mind like the sharing economy, quote unquote, because it's in a different category. It's impossible to argue with the common flu either, right? So uh, at a time, many state governments try to use old world methods such as confiscating, like in Paris, they confiscated the office, confiscated the machines, put people to jail, and then the 
next morning Uber still operates. Um, right? So it, it doesn't really work uh, in the old governmental methods. And so we, we thought about it, and, and we thought that you know during the Occupy, where people listen to each other's positions deeply and uh, feel each other's feelings around the CSSTA, maybe we can reuse some of that technique and to work on the Uber issue. Um, basically, we think that deliberation is a vaccine of the mind. Once people have really felt and empathized with different sides, positions, and come up with common values, people become immune to specific virus of the mind um, in the future. So um, I promise to check the questions at this point. So I'm just going to do it right now. Um, There's 17 questions. Maybe I'll just. All right. So I'll finish this section and then switch right back to questions. So a proper deliberation involves uh, four different stages. Uh, we used a, a system invented in Canada in 2005. It's called the Focus Conversation Method, or FCM. And it's known as the ORID method also because it separates the discussion into four different stages. The first is ob objective, or facts, where people ask each other, like the government publishes open data, all we know about UberX. And we also ask all the private sector and civil society to donate data into this shared fact-checked database. And once people check the facts on the timeline, we can all agree with the facts, the various stakeholders then express their feelings. For the same fact, you may feel angry and I may feel happy and it's all okay. And it's not until we checked everybody's feelings that we find that there's some resonating feelings that people all feel as important concerns to ideate on. So after the facts, the feelings is the ideas, the best ideas ideas are the ideas that takes care of the most people's feelings. And once we um, uncover those ideas, they, we then translate it into legalese. Now, uh, using the old governmental method, the main barrier is the language barrier. The professional public servants, the private sector lobbyists, and the independents like academics and so on use a professional language, while people on the street using a different language. And so under this um, under this situation, when people say the same thing but mean very different things, um, the facts and the feelings get clouded, and ideas in this environment become ideologies. Ideologies are an even more potent virus of mind that blinds people to new facts and to each other's feelings. And so after we get everybody on the same page, checking the facts that by itself is important, we use a, a free software system under HGPL uh, called uh, Polis. And Polis uh, is a so-called AI-powered conversation that basically just provides a face to the crowd. So we ask everybody to basically look at one statement that their friends or just a random person on the internet uh, propose about their feeling, um, their their 感觉, uh, 觉得 something. So I think that or I feel that. Um, passenger liability insurance is important. So as you agree or disagree with the statements, your avatar will move among your uh, social media friends, or you don't have to log in among well-known people on social media, so that you can discover that s so your friends and your family actually think about this in a very different perspective, but they're still your friends and family, you just didn't talk about this over dinner. So it, it makes it um, difficult for people to uh, antagonize, to treat people with different viewpoints as enemies, but rather it enables people to say that, okay, after answering a few yes and no questions, uh, I can also contribute my feelings, and people kind of compete on feelings that resonates with the most number of people because we say if your um, ideas or if your feelings resonates with a super majority amount of people that, that is uh, across all the groups, every group has more than majority agreeing with you, then the um, feelings and proposals with the most resonance, with the most consensus, we use that as the agenda to talk with the stakeholders, with the taxi unions, with the Uber people and so on. And so in this way, we send the same URL to everybody and they spread it. And one of the key interface design is the decisions during a polis discussion, unlike many other social media uh, venues, is that you don't see the reply button here. There is no reply. And what we discovered is if, is if you have reply, people focus their energy on discrediting the person who uh, posted a comment that they don't agree with. But like Slido, uh, Polis, basically, if you see something that you don't agree with, your best recourse is to uh, propose something more nuanced that 
other people can agree with. And so after a few weeks, um, in all the police discussions, what we see is that people recognize their differences in those divisive statements, but they don't spend more time on it. Uh, and people instead uh, spend a lot of time on refining the nuanced consensus so that people can resonate, kind of compete with the most resonance across the different groups. And so we use a live consultation method where all the stakeholders are invited, uh, the taxi company, Uber, union people, and so on, the co-ops, and so on. Uh, and we just checked with them all the agenda set by this police conversation one by one, saying, do you agree? And if you don't, why? If you do, why? And because it's live stream with thousands of people watching, uh, people become bound to whatever they have said. So Uber at the time said, OK, so we'll work with our drivers to help them obtain professional driver's license. And they're bound by the words they spoke at this live stream meeting. And so uh, uh, just um, after this, we then work on ratifying the new, what we call the diversity diversification of taxi. And one of the most highest score is actually contributed by the free software community by Irvin uh, from the Mozilla community here, uh, who said that we should take this opportunity to upgrade the taxi regulations so that the best practices from, from Uber, for example, taxi doesn't have to be painted yellow, and there's a two-way rating system and so on, could be used to facilitate better taxi qualities uh, here in Taiwan. And so led by that consensus and six other uh, consensus items, we then created a law so that now Uber is operating legally in Taiwan, but only with uh, registered drivers, licensed cars. And you also get email about your rides and uh, insurance and so on on uh, every Uber ride. And you can also call taxi with Uber and actually vice versa. And so this is uh, what we call a multi-stakeholder consultation and after which people's consensus set the agenda for the politicians to talk about. So let's take some questions. So um, there's. 13 people, um, I think 15 now, uh, would like to know, how can we help other governments enable open standards? This is an excellent question. Um, so in Taiwan, we have this idea of the um, GDSP, or the um, Government Digital Service Principle. It is modeled loosely uh, after the, GD, uh, the Government Digital Service in the UK, who also published their digital standards. Um, and the GDS is kind of a thought leader uh, in this area, and they pioneered a lot of digital standards that are not just uh, open as in open source, or open as in open protocol, or format, but open as in open innovation, where people, everybody can contribute. And one of their key principles um, is um, being user-centric, uh, which we hear expanded in Taiwan, meaning that the users here uh, not only include citizens, but also people working in the front line uh, in the public service. And the second thing that the UK GDS also um, basically advocates is that when you build a digital service, you need not to only test with people and the frontline staff, but also test with the minister in the cabinet uh, from the beginning to the end, because ultimately they're accountable for this digital service, and they can then solicit more idea, uh, open innovation from this service. And again, uh, we um, adopted this spirit and also uh, called for the leader to be um, basically cross-disciplinary. Um, but I, I think the person who asked this question is maybe most interested uh, in uh, our GDSP number eight, which says uh, open uh, first, basically. Open is the priority. And um, basically to reduce the time spent on this, uh, developing services and the total cost of uh, ownership, Open should be the foremost principle when designing and building services. And by open, we mean specifically that all the machine-to-machine -machine data um, built by this system need to be available under an open license, most commonly the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license, uh, which is the default license for all the ICT systems built in Taiwan. And also, we prioritize open source. Um, and if the uh, service component reuses existing open source uh, components, we recommend people to use Linux Foundation's SpeedX or SPDX manifest to basically uh, solve this uh, warranty issue 
issue for the system integrators because once they declare their um, reusable free software components under Speedix, um, the warranty um, in the legal perspective has a clear delineation. And so by this, we want to encourage people to innovate based on what the government has delivered and improve on existing government services by forking the government and occasionally getting it right and getting governments merging it back. Um, but not only open data and open source, we also say that it needs to conform with open standards and so that it could be reused and also it's built on common API and common components. And all this is so that we can quickly reiterate and improve the services. And so we have a, a support group of all the governments uh, who endorse this, uh, this standard. Um, it's called Digital Nations, um, and previously known as Digital 5 or Digital 7, depending on the number of people in it. Um, but we have a, a chat channel, we share GitHub repositories, uh, we basically communicate uh, very regularly, so um, so that the governments who embrace open by default has this um, venue. And I think our next meeting uh, is in Forward 50 uh, in Ottawa, in Canada, uh, this this November. And so basically, all the governments uh, are solving very much similar issues. And all the components that we deliver is not just uh, for improvement of our citizens, but also offering it so that it could be reused by the government and people building their own self-governance system. Not necessarily state government or representative governments uh, worldwide. So the short answer to this is to um, develop and adhere to a clear government digital service principle to publish and circulate this widely, to encourage this in the procurement laws and to encourage this in the accountability, in the auditing laws, in the statistics laws, which we all have done, and then participate internationally in support groups uh, in the democratic and open governance uh, governments and basically share these best practice or at least better practices um, as open toolkits, and that's the, the thing that we're, we're doing. Um, Twelve people um, would like me to answer, what do I wish from Debian? So <laughs> um, I, I wish that Debian live long and prosper, and <laughs> because <laughs> Because, because really, um, uh, uh, along with uh, other large endeavors, right, like the, the Mozilla uh, Foundation and the Linux Foundation, which I just mentioned, the Wikimedia Foundation, um, so you, you folks are the foundation upon which that we're advocating to the representative democratic system that, hey, there is some merit <laughs> in this kind of radical transparency and a kind of radical participation. And as a anarchist, uh, conservative anarchist uh, minister, um, I I have three conditions going in uh, the cabinet. The first is that I don't issue a command to anyone, nor do I take a command. Everything is by voluntary association. And this is uh, straight from the Debian constitution, uh, where by constitution, nobody can really be forced into doing any non-voluntary work. And the second one is that uh, I get to work anywhere on the planet, and it still counts as working. So it's teleworking, and it also enabled uh, a lot of e-government apparatus when people discover that by a paper-based um, delivery they can't really reach me. Uh, well, they can reach me after a week or so. Uh, it is far easier if you just use email. And <laughs> But the, the third thing also um, very important is that uh, when I de develop um, this uh, voluntary uh, co-creation methodologies, um, it is important for me to be radically transparent. And by radical transparency, I mean not just uh, meeting with lobbyists and journalists are all published online, even internal meetings that I chair, uh, we also publish everything as a transcript uh, two weeks after every internal meeting. And uh, so, so it looks like this is also using a free software system called Say It, uh, developed by, I think, my society. Uh, in the UK. So like when Debbie Plouffe, uh, speaking for Uber at the time, come to uh, lobby and have a conversation, not only is our discussion on the record, it's on 360 record, so we can put on a VR cardboard or something and relive the conversation. And every uh, utterance has a permanent URL, so you can f get full account accountability of who said what 
where. And, and this is important for the government service because the public servants in this situation, they become very innovative, uh, contrary to popular belief. Because previously, when something gets right uh, and people like it, the minister always takes all the credit. And if something gets wrong, it's always the career public servants who you know, didn't execute well or something, uh, and the netizens has a way to, to blame the, the people in charge for it. So it, 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 in that situation, there's no motivation for them to innovate. But now, with this radically transparent system, not only is the civil society more understanding of the context before making a decision, but also all the credit gets shared to the actual career public servants who propose something innovative in the first place. And if anything goes wrong, well, because as far as I know, I'm the only uh, minister in the world doing this, it's all Audrey's fault. So uh, basically, <laughs> people, I can absorb the blame while people share the credit. So we get a lot of very innovative ideas, uh, frankly, from the public service, such as adopting a thoroughly free software system called Sandstorm IO for our entire public service and in all the different branches of government, not just the administration. And so basically, we use only free software on this Sandstorm IO system. Davros replaces Dropbox, either Calc replaces Google Spreadsheet, either Pa uh, replaces Google Doc, we can replace this Trello, and there's also Rocket Chat, and I'm sure you know the other tools that the free software people uses. And basically, we say any public servants, as long as they have a GOVTW email address, uh, can enjoy this for free and even develop new applications on it because it's cybersecurity hardened. Uh, we ask our best white hat hackers to, to attack it and filed a few CVEs so that we're reasonably <laughs> sure that it's very secure now so that people can develop applications by themselves, which is free software, and like, um, I don't know, planning travels together, ordering lunch boxes together, and things like that, and unleash innovation within the government because they know that this system can absorb the cybersecurity risk and I can absorb the political risk. Um, 17 people would like to know, quote, it's good that you discovered Debian and what makes it interesting at such a young age. Do you run Debian yourself? Have you contributed to Debian? Um, personally, my desktop uh, environment, um, when I started learning, I think it's around 1999, um, like system level programming, I'm sorry, has always been FreeBSD. And so <laughs> I, I, I've, I've never <laughs> actually, um, I, I use the Debian compatibility layer. I don't know whether that's, that counts or not. <laughs> but I, I've always been a FreeBSD uh, developer and contributed to also driver support in FreeBSD and also uh, most of my contributions um, um, in the Perl community and in Open Foundry here in Taiwan in the early 2000s were uh, first committed uh, to the FreeBSD port system. So it's a different culture. It's not copy left, it's not copyright, it's copy center. You go to the copy center and make many copies, and so that's a uh, very permissive <laughs> community. The, that, that's my primary community, the, the FreeBSD community. Uh, but um, there's various uh, efforts uh, within Debian to reconcile uh, with, for example, the uh, module signing system, uh, I, I piloted um, the uh, module signing system in CPAN in the Comprehensive Pro Archive Network, and so there's a lot of packaging uh, issues and so on, so I basically chime in from, from here to there, but I did not participate in the Debian um, democracy, but I really admire it uh, from afar in the FreeBSD camp. <laughs> yeah. um, does Taiwan has an open source strategy? Yes, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so it, it's called DigiPlus. Um, and I don't know what, how much of this is translated into English. Oh, all of it. Okay, it's good. So uh, if you go to smart.taiwan.gov.tw, so we, we tend to have one web page for each uh, major uh, government policies. So there's smart Taiwan GOVTW, there's AI Taiwan, there's bio Taiwan, there's also CI Taiwan. I, I think that's not yet translated, where the CI stands for civil IoT, uh, which is the um, shared open data and also open algorithm platform for all the different environmental data aggregated in a supercomputing center that combines the people's, the, like the GovZero side of uh, air sensors and also the government side of uh, government sensors, and so that we can all talk with the same uh, fact-based uh, or evidence-based uh, policymaking process. So I encourage you to check out Smart Taiwan and also links to Asia, Silicon Valley, and things like that. And so uh, when we talk about open society here and also about the education, uh, like 
interdisciplinary digital talents. In the DigiPlus plan, we specifically said, especially in the basic education level, that is to say K-12 to level, but also uh, because in the next five years, all the college level students also need to learn computational thinking and programming, uh, half of it, I think, um, by the year like 2021 or something. Um, all of it needs to be based on free software. Um, if the student graduates and joins the private sector and choose to use proprietary software, that is their choice, and of course the government can't do much about it. But while they're still children, while they're still in the schools, it is very important for us to not let the um, children or the students to be uh, subject to vendor login, so that by the time they graduate, maybe the vendor has already moved somewhere else, maybe the vendor lose interest in that product line, and we see a lot of that dynamic so at least in the education system, we're very firm that we prefer free software uh, for education. And when teaching computational thinking, when teaching artificial intelligence, when teaching all those different, um, you know, uh, DG plus power, smart machinery, green energy technology, and so on, we prefer free software when it's in the school. And so in the DG plus, there is a strategy to uh, raise awareness and uh, have talents um, in, in school. And there's also TWOSS. Dot io, I think, I hope I remember this right, um, which is a, again, not yet translated in English. Oh, it's somewhat translated to English, but in any case, yes, so what, what this tr tries to do is basically by getting people sufficient education materials so people working on any level of education can point to existing communities and introduce their students to such community and even people working in like city level government or um, national level government can also point to the work cases of uh, incorporating like Postgres SQL or like the OpenStack or um, Docker ecosystem and or TensorFlow or whatever uh, and, and which is the success story and you're replacing proprietary systems and because it's not about procurement anymore we already change our procurement regulations and the government digital service principle all that people need now is a boost of confidence of basically uh, by people <laughs> keep telling them it's okay to use free software and so this is the TWOSS.io endeavor and if you find anything you know wrong with it or anything you can contribute please feel free to let us know in TWOSS um, what is Taiwan so restrictive on internet access, captive portals, registrars ID for ITEL and Wi-Fi access, etc.? Is there a reason, bad experiences or not? Well, the, the reason is usually cited as, quote, cybersecurity, unquote, but uh, it is um, not a very strong reason. We are actively looking, actually, uh, like in the Taiwan high-speed rails to relax the cap captive portal, because um, especially when you're on a high speed moving uh, train, it is very difficult to actually resume from hotspot to hotspots uh, if you need to go through like five or three uh, screens uh, to register. So that's the first uh, place where we will relax this captive portal um, thing. And then once this is um, done and piloted and proven that there it really doesn't need to more, um, you know, cybersecurity guards that we can put out here, cybersecurity guards elsewhere on the stack, not necessarily on the personal identification level, then we will also relax the um, like internal um, within the government agencies. We often provide two Wi-Fi's, one for employees uh, of the government and one called ITAI, one also for visitors. So the visitor Wi-Fi, we then will also look to re relax more. And that's because uh, in uh, those two venues, uh, in the high-speed rails and also in uh, visitors to government agencies, you already did your registration somewhere else. Where we don't uh, physically actually need you to re register again. I'm less sure about the city level public Wi-Fi, like TPE free or other state level Wi-Fi uh, because they have a certain level of autonomy and we don't actually dictate what they do. But uh, we just um, pilot uh, this relaxed um, login portal thing uh, and also establish uh, corresponding cybersecurity rules and maybe the state level um, people will also get enlightened. Uh, we'll see. There's um, 11 people uh, who want to know, is it possible to be a citizen in Taiwan and interact fully with the government without using any proprietary software? I'm glad you asked, because that's one of the cases that I'd like to show. Uh, <laughs> it, it used to be very, very difficult. Um, so just last May, actually, there was a petition that uh, talks explicitly about it. 
and very explicit. Um, <laughs> um, last May, there was a uh, e-petition, our national e-petition system, which uh, after 5,000 people participate online, you can use email or SMS, uh, it, it's not a real name basis, um, but basically after 5,000 people countersigned a petition, the government is obliged uh, to, re uh, to respond to it. And this petition is by this um, user experience designer, Zhuo Zhiyuan, which says um, that our text filing system is explosively hostile to users. So it's kind of uh, negative energy uh, in that petition. There's more negative energy in the body, which I will spare you the quote. Um, but that basically at the time, uh, about 80% of comments uh, in that petition discussion area is very negative. It costs for the resignment of the Minister of Finance. It costs, there's a lot of accusations to the vendors uh, who provide the system. And all because um, in Windows, there is a proprietary uh, Windows-based application for tax filing, but for Linux and for Mac and basically non-Windows systems, uh, there is a Java applet. And because last last year Oracle INC uh, deprecated Java applets, um, the user experience become very very bad. People will see that uh, please wait, it's still installing some applet components, but because the pop-up is by default blocked, right? So th nothing happens, and after 40 minutes, people are still waiting. Uh, and so it really is very, very difficult to use. And after the e-petition, uh, we basically there's a participation officer team in each ministry, and each participation officer, or POs, is responsible, just like media officer who talk to journalists or parliamentary officer who talk to MPs, POs talk to such emergent petitions. And by basically saying, I think, not only uh, very quick, like 36 hours after this petition, uh, our PO Yang Jingheng uh, just posted publicly that everybody who complained about our tax filing experience on non-Windows systems is cordially invited to a co-creation workshop some Friday in the Ministry of Finance. And this is very interesting because just by proposing this invitation, previously like 80% of people were just flaming and 20% of people were saying, well, we're using Windows, it works kind of okay, but nobody really uh, the key to them. Uh, after this invitation is sent, 80% of people started proposing useful suggestions, useful recommendations, and only less than 20% still remained um, trolling or flaming people, but people don't um, pay attention to them anymore. So basically, what we did was inviting the, um, the trolls, and who turns out to be not trolls, they were just fed up with the text filing system, and they had to vent their feelings. But after they vent their feelings, we all then solicited ideas from them, and people who can make it to Taipei, make it to Taipei, otherwise people can still um, participate using live streaming. And one of the key things here is radical transparency and also accountability, meaning that people who say that uh, it's, you know, the words are explosively crowded, uh, which is put that post-it as words are explosively crowded, that it is so brilliantly written that people are confused, uh, and then we just post it. And uh, people say, you know, instead of designing a system that makes people feel better, people don't feel good at all when they think about filing taxes, and so we should shorten the experience instead of trying to make people feel better, and so on. And so uh, basically people who propose such uh, ideations online, we just uh, use service design methodologies and hold uh, five co-creation workshops with all the different stakeholders involved in the text filing experience. So that uh, this year, the text filing experience for non-Windows uh, systems is entirely HTML5 based, it adheres to the open standards, uh, people can just use any platform that can run a browser uh, to access the text filing system. So the short question to, uh, to short answer to this question is that it has become more and more possible um, while while we trans or transform uh, existing desktop oriented or Windows specific or Java applets um, into um, web based uh, situations. Now, if you uh, insist that all the JavaScript libraries and CSS libraries uh, that government system use has also to be open source or free software, uh, that would take a little bit more time. You will need uh, the current generation of system to be wholly replaced by post government, government digital service principle, post GTSP systems. But we are 
focusing on reducing the load on the client side first. So at a time, I think you can complete most of the interactions of the uh, governmental um, issues like filing taxes and so on uh, if you're okay with using a free software browser, but there's still some proprietary JavaScript code. This is kind of the compromise situation we're in at the moment. But with the rollout of GDSP, we're also looking to make the JavaScript and CSS and also the backend systems more uh, non-proprietary. Um, Anonymous would like to know, um, the shared objects uh, in the uh, text filing plugin is not open source, why? Um, because the copyright belongs to, uh, I think, the vendor, uh, Zhonghua Telecom, uh, and back when we signed the um, agreement with the Zhonghua Telecom, uh, the GDSP was not in effect, and so uh, the contract basically attributed the copyright to the vendor who only conferred usage right to the government and the citizens. This is a mistake that we will not re repeat, uh, but uh, at the moment we don't have the legal recourse uh, for the current generation of plugin systems to be relicensed. Uh, as free software, I tried. Uh, but <laughs> the, the easiest way is just for the next uh, version of identification um, methods, such as the National Healthcare Card, which, by the way, is currently in public consultation. If you want to um, contribute, like you demand free software stack for the entire um, for the entire Medicare system. Uh, please feel free to go to join GOVTW, where we are now um, asking for consultation on people who are looking to virtualize their uh, universal Medicare card and or and or uh, to use NFC-based uh, authentication. So we want to know about people's preference when it comes to the technology, to the regulations, as well as to the total cost of ownership and also of usage. And so if you feel strongly about it, please do contribute online on join platform so that we can say to the um, people writing the contracts that people really feel that this is very important for our next generation authentication methods to be non-proprietary, so please. All right, um, so eight people would like to know, what is your opinion on e-commerce application refusing to operate on restriction of free devices like rooted Androids and jailbroken iDevices? Is it fair? Well, um, mostly I think uh, they do this um, with the call to, you know, quote, fraud prevention, unquote. Um, it, it's, <laughs> it's not it's not about fairness, I think. It is about the choice or the freedom of choice or the, the liberty of users. The reason why GDSP prefers free software is because when it comes to healthcare or tax filing, there really is no choice. Uh, to be a citizen in Taiwan, uh, you have to go through some government-sponsored API endpoints to produce some you know, government-sponsored uh, form data and so on, and because there is no choice, um, we, we really need to be open so that people can um, hold us to account to be more transparent and also innovate on existing solutions. But for um, e-commerce applications where there are no de facto monopolies, when people still have a choice, um, the government at the moment does not take a stance against um, the e-commerce apps who uses um, you know, fraud detection or prevention uh, methods that uh, result in incompatibility with rooted uh, Androids and jailbroken iDevices. Um, I think one of the possible um, direction out of this dilemma is to basically talk to people who work on quote fraud prevention unquote and just like how we talked with uh, the high speed rails and the government agencies providing Taiwan uh, software and, and sorry Wi-Fi for free uh, we basically said you can do your fraud pre prevention or cybersecurity on another layer in this system and not in the particular layer of requiring a captive portal and the MAC uh, address, which is very easy to spoof anyway, uh, right? So, so I think just by talking to people like this, or we talk to people who advocate copyright uh, uh, protection through blocking of the internet, we say, you know, with IPv6, it's getting more and more impossible, and watermarking or real-time watermarking um, methodologies, it Im infringes on the consumers or customers' experiences less, and it is actually a better solution overall than just banning entire websites and so on. So people have legitimate interests, they are legitimate mistakes, but as I said, 
Often uh, we think of it as like a tug of war, but in many different cases it is possible actually with some what we call social innovation, a innovation that basically takes care of all the different sides of interest and leaves nobody worse off. So I would encourage people to feel strongly about it, to contact your local friendly um, e-commerce uh, association like uh, and so on, who does have a forum to talk about things like this. We use that forum to talk about uh, fraud detection and prevention of uh, like people selling counterfeit goods on Facebook uh, to pretty good effect. So I would also encourage you to contact your local association about it. Um, can we see any legislators supporting free software in the government mo uh, movement like public money, public code from the EFF? Well, um, in Taiwan, uh, when, when you see this, this government, the GDSP, um, we, we already say this, right? This is public code, this is open data, and this is open standards, and also uh, common APIs. Um, and we used also a Linux Foundation uh, project called uh, OAS3, which was Swagger, um, to, to say that all the different systems built, as long as it has a machine-to-machine -machine component, need to adhere to this machine-to-machine -machine open API specification. And the reason why we put an equal amount of attention on the source code license versus the machine-to-machine -machine, um, integration is that if we only talk about public code or the license, it is very often that the system integrator would deliver something that is technically uh, free software, but it depends on, for example, expensive Oracle systems or even more expensive DB2 systems and, and things like that. And, and that basically still restricts the reuse across different ministries and agencies. But by saying, you know, for all the import and export, for all the batch level access, by basically treating machine to machine accessibility the same way we treat universal access like for blind people, we basically say while you may still depend on Oracle or DB2 at a point, the next vendor can just build on your API and even batch export what's in this um, public money paid database and rebuild a service without depending on any proprietary technological stack. So I would argue that the freedom of portability is as important as freedom to fork and freedom to reuse, and both are, of course, very important. Um, and constitutional, I'm not supposed to speculate on legislators, uh, but there's various uh, younger legislators in all the different parties uh, who are also interested in this area. Is there any chance, uh, a people would like to know, that I can urge deans of higher education facilities like NCTU to deploy IP version 6? Um, well, it's kind of a bootstrapping problem, isn't it? But <laughs> This year, we, we see a surge of IPv6 adoption, actually, um, after Taiwan Nick um, changed hands and <laughs> in, embraced a very IPv6 first uh, ro roadmap. Uh, we see, for example, Zhonghua Telecom has uh, drastically increased the IPv6 connectivity of their mobile clients. And we see also see other telecoms and other peering um, institutions and ISPs starting to adopt this trend. And so once there's sufficient amount of um, people using the clients that are IPv6 enabled and even IPv6 preferred, uh, there will be sufficient pressure then for the service providers uh, to provide um, as good, if not better, service uh, over IPv6. And so I, I feel your QQ, I, I help you your QQ, uh, but, <laughs> um, but, but I found uh, QQ, right? But, but I, I think really it is up to the students and the clients and the users of the internet, the last mile providers, to first uh, build a useful and and usable IPv6 environment before we can then demand um, the service providers to, to do so. But we are seeing pretty good trends uh, as of this year, and so if you come back next year, I think there will be sufficient uh, demand from the user's side uh, to have um, the institutional uh, internet service providers to provide IPv6 also. Um, so I'm technically uh, <coughs> uh, out of time. So I'll just take one last question. What is my opinion of the European Union General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR? Um, my opinion is that the GDPR is a much needed conversation that translates the idea of data uh, from what 
people will confuse with assets, intellectual properties, which are leaky abstractions that doesn't mean anything um, to a what we call data agency or a relationship-based worldview. Basically, as a government institution, if I hold your data, this is a beginning of a relationship where you can ask what happens to the data, who can update the data so it reflects the purpose. And if I try to use the data in any way other than pure statistics, I need to check with you first so that you can you know, know what's going on and provide the most up-to-date data instead of leaving you know, just a shadow digital trail that's five years out of date that results in more bias. And so I think data agency and data as a relationship and also data accountability, accountability interestingly translate in Mandarin as three different words. Uh, for people who ask for accountability, it's called wenzi. For us who, holds, who are held accountable, it's called dangzi. We should be accountable. And the system within it that holds both sides together, the relationship is called kezi jiji, or a accountability mechanism. So wenzi, dangzi, and kezi is a relational concept. It is not a one-time transactional um, concept. And I think GDPR is a much needed um, wake-up call for everybody to see data as relationship and not as some digital asset or intellectual property. So thank you very much.